The Drum Candy Podcast is brought to you by Drum Factory Direct. Welcome into episode 9 of season 5 of the Drum Candy Podcast. This is your host, Mike Dawson, coming to you from Drum Factory Direct in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This week's episode is all about snare drums, in particular, exotic wood species snare drums that Chris Carr at Bucks County Drums have built and sent over for us to check out. So we'll dig into that in a minute, but first, let's get to what's new. Next week on Tuesday, January 23rd from 6 to 9 p.m., if you're in the Pittsburgh area, head over to Hawthorne Drum Shop in McKees Rock, Pennsylvania. That is just north of downtown Pittsburgh. I'll be there along with David Throckmorton. I'm going to be doing a drum tuning clinic from like 6.15 to 7, and then probably from 7.15, 7.30 to 8.30 or however long we go, uh, Throck will give a clinic there. So if you need more info, we're asking everyone to RSVP on the Facebook event. You can find that at the Drum Factory Direct Facebook page on my personal page, also on Hawthorne's page, just so we know how many, basically how much pizza to order, how much drinks to have, and how much space to clear out. Again, that's January 23rd, 6 to 9 p.m. at Hawthorne Drum Shop. That's co-sponsored with Drum Factory Direct, the Drum Candy Podcast, Driftwood Pizza, and the Pennsylvania chapter of the Percussive Arts Society. It's free, three hours of hang. It's pretty casual. Um, We'll see you there. We've also just announced another great event on April 28th. That is a Sunday from 4 to 6. We are bringing in my good friend and the amazing drummer, Carter McLean, to do a master class. This is a paid ticketed event. It is $99 for a seat. We are limiting it to 35 seats, and you can order your tickets at Eventbrite. Just search for Carter McLean master class, and you'll find it. It's also available Um, If you look at the Drum Factor Direct Facebook page or the Hawthorne Drum Shop pages, we'll be promoting it there a bunch. Again, don't wait too long. We are expecting this to sell out pretty quickly. That is April 28th from 4 to 6 p.m. That's a Sunday afternoon. Come hang out with Carter McLean, myself, Hawthorne, and a bunch of other drummers. Okay, let's get to the main segment of the episode. We are talking about exotic wood snare drums with my good friend Chris Carr of Bucks County Drums. Chris built six identical drums. They're all five and a half by 14. They are, they are all eight ply, 100% of different exotic species with no re-rings, eight lugs, single point, um, I think they're aluminum lugs, single point aluminum lugs, strip of flange hoops. So all the drums are identical except for the wood species. Chris makes his own shells, so we talk a bunch about that process. We dig into what each species does. So give me, let me give you a little bit of um, a little bit of info on what we got. So we've got an African mahogany drum, which is around 1,200 on the Janka hardness scale. We have a Babinga drum, which is 1980 on the Janka hardness scale. That is from Africa. We have Jatoba, which is getting harder. That is 2350. We have a Bolivian rosewood, which is somewhere between 2200 and 2400 on the hardness scale. We have satin wood, which is one I never heard of, which is 2620 on the hardness scale. And then we have a Makassar ebony, which is really hard at 3220 on the Janko hardness scale. These are all are quite hard woods, um, pretty rare. Um, so it's, I just wanted to pick Chris's brain about like the process of making this stuff and kind of you know, what to expect with exotic wood species snare drums. So let's get into it. Exotic snare drums with Chris Carr. Well, we're here to talk about exotic snare drums. So we did, I don't know, when was that? Last year, we did a roundup of, of domestic snare drums, five and a half by 14s. Yep. They were all the same eight ply shells, I believe. Yep. Straight shells. Yep. Um, and that was super fun. And then we... We kind of foreshadowed doing this exotic thing. We finally got it together. So yeah, it took some time. I've had my hands on six of these drums for a while, so I want to go through each one, talk about the species, just kind of talk about the concept of of exotic shells. First, we have to kind of define it. What does it mean? What is an exotic wood? My understanding is it just means anything that's not readily available in North America. Or the pretty state. much, yeah, that's pretty much it. You know, there's stuff that's uh, more standardized. However, so a species such as silver birch that I've been dabbling with late, lately comes from Europe. It's European birch. Is that considered so, a exotic? Yeah, I would. Okay. It's it's not you know anything that's not domestic. That's okay. the way I look at it. Now, when we think of exotic, we think of 
stuff that's really ornate has a lot of grain to it, uh-huh. a certain hardness to it, you know, mahogany being the most bland probably. Uh, however, it sounds unique. And, uh, you know, as we talked about before, there's a couple different kinds of mahoganies too. So, so yeah, anything that's not in the United States, not in North okay. America. Um, and then how do you decide on which of these species that you picked for this collection of exotic snares? Well, in this case, it was kind of availability mm-hmm. of, of veneers. Uh, it's not, these are not standard species uh, you find in abundance, and they're also generally fairly expensive. So uh, I wanted to I wanted to contrast like the Jatoba and the Bubinga. I wanted to see if there were major differences or how similar they were. The mahogany being a standard, I want to utilize that. I really wanted to use Purple Heart, but I, at the time I couldn't find an adequate source for that. And it's kind of been done to death. There's a lot of people doing that already. So I wanted to do something that were some things were standard and some things were outside of the, the realms of normality. So it's a, a good chance that some of these will not be available, be available again. I think of like Babinga, wasn't it endangered, like off the off the market for a while? Well, it just because it's on the the sites index doesn't mean it's not available. What they do is they put a cap on how much they can harvest. It is protected. The sites index really has no way of of uh, uh, enforcing that. Mm-hmm. You know, people can go and they can har- harvest this stuff anyway, <clears throat> and they have really no way. You know, they can try to find them, but it's basically an organization. It's not a legitimate, you know, it's really up to each country, each municipality, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And, and and it makes sense. Uh, however, there's an abundance of it right now in the United States. Most of the, you know, lumber yards and sources all carry it pretty well, pretty good stock. And it's priced pretty affordably right now, too. So it is more expensive than your standard species, but it's it's also uh, pretty affordable. Okay. So, yeah, not like Ebony. Ebony is, you know, one of the higher ones. So so the, the, the species we have here, you mentioned mahogany. This is um, which variation of mahogany? African mahogany, also known as Kaya. Each each species has two to three different names. It has a scientific name, and then it has two or three different, you know, variations of that. So, so how does African mahogany compare to what you would get on, let's say, an entry level mahogany kit? Uh, I don't know what comes on like on those on um, um, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, you you know anything Philippine mahogany is Asian <clears throat> mahogany is another. It's like an offshoot. You know, uh, South American mahogany is considered the true mahogany. It's the purest tone. It's also softer than the African mahogany, mm. but there's it, it's again it's a little bit protected and and it's not as abundant. It's it's a little more expensive. The, the African mahogany is extremely abundant big trees can harvest it. And it sounds pretty good. It's harder though. It's a harder, a harder mahogany. Okay. Yeah. And what was the next, was he the next one that might be the most um, familiar? Babingo, we mentioned that. Where does that yeah. come from? That's also African. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's, you know, it's one of those species. It's relatively hard uh, wood, uh, you know, it's 1980 on the Janka scale. We talk about the Janka scale any, all the time uh, with regard to wood hardness. And <clears throat> it's pretty abundant. It's it's nice to work with, but it produces a really nice sound. You know, it's, it just works. You know, I made a few kits of that this year. And then, and the snare drums are surprisingly, they had a really nice bite and, and big. Uh, pretty easy to control, too, in terms of sound. Nice, nice to work with. Now, the one that, that has two names that I'm familiar with, Jatoba is also a cherry, correct? Brazil, Brazilian cherry because okay. of the color, you know, a uh, bit harder than the, than the Bibinga. Looks similar, mm-hmm. has very, you know, I mean, Bibinga varies a lot. All these species vary greatly. Some, some are pretty consistent. Uh, but these these are ones that really kind of vary greatly. And you can buy three different trees and get three different completely different looks um but it's a bit harder um than than the bubinga about the same to work with uh but it also has excellent sound properties um i really like it how does that uh, compare to domestic cherry is it totally different oh it's a lot harder totally different 
not it's even just a, just a word. They're not even related. Yeah, it's just for the look. You know, it, 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 it's in its natural state. It kind of looks like aged domestic cherry. Hmm. If that makes sense, cherry in itself, domestic cherry, is pretty light and pale and pink. Over time, it ages to a deep, you know, reddish brown honey color. And this wood already kind of has that look already, the aged cherry, if that makes sense. So yep. they call it cherry. Yeah. All right. So let's get to the three more, I think, kind of more um, expensive, I guess, versions. Extreme, yeah. <clears throat> so Not a book. Yeah. Let's say, I mean, Rosewood's probably the one I've heard the most because of, you know, marimba bars and guitars and things you made of Rosewood. Exactly. Yeah. That's uh, also African? <clears throat> uh, no, <laughs> South, well, no, there are African Rosewoods, but no, it's South America. But from, there's 300 species of Rosewood. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't even begin to start. But the, the Bolivian Rosewood that I selected is also called Santo, Santos Rosewood, which you just said they use that primarily in marimbas. Mm. And uh, it, because it's got it's a tone wood, you can pick up a block of that stuff, and if you suspend it, suspend it properly, and tap it, it'll sing. So they use that in varying thicknesses and sizes and shapes to achieve the sounds they achieve in marimbas. They do use an African wood called paddock, um, which is much softer and uh, mellower. So if you want a louder marimba, you go rosewood, uh, that kind of thing. So oh. yeah. It's also really pretty, you know, it's 2200 on the scale. So it's a bit harder than, um, you know, Bibinga, uh, not as hard as the, or around the same hardness, a little less than uh, Bajitoba. So these are all pretty similar too. And, and I wanted to kind of, the extremes being the mahogany and the ebony, which we haven't talked about, but we will, um, with these middle, this middle bunch being relatively close. Cause so it was really interesting to see what they would do where does like a normal like uh maple fall on the hardness scale comparison uh american north american hard maple is 1450. so that's a really good reference i give all the time you and know where was the mahogany again i'm losing track mahogany is around 1200. okay so that's around softer than a maple yeah <clears throat> yeah it's so, it, it varies depending on where it's grown and, and the and the uh, uh and whatnot but it's usually in the 1200 range Okay. And then South American mahogany is in the 900 range. It's very close to cherry. Okay. American cherry, domestic cherry. So when people talk about domestic cherry, uh, they think of it as a really hard wood. Now it's a stable wood. It's really, it is hard. It's really nice to work with. I used to use it in my cabinet work all the time. Mm -hmm. However, on the scale, it's pretty soft. It's 900 range. Interesting. Yeah. So but the it assumption over, that these exotic woods are hard woods is not correct. They can be all over this, all over the scale. It's not, but generally they are. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just the nature of the of those species. You know, there's there's some that are much less hard, but it seems like when you get over into Africa and South America, they're generally pretty hard wood. At least the ones that we all want to use for for something, mm -hmm. furniture. We always look for stability, reliability, rot, rot was big back in the day because, you know, furniture, you don't want things to rot. Mm. Everything's made of plies now, so it doesn't. <laughs> oh, yeah, right, right. You know, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, the next one, probably the, the one I never heard of before, satin wood. Is there another name for that that we might be familiar with? Yeah, the one that we, we used is called Ceylon. Uh, I, I think I'm saying that correctly. Um, it's C-E-Y-L-O-N, Ceylon, Ceylon comes from uh i believe india there's like three places i i since i originally made this and we originally spoke i, I thought there was one one area that they came from so it's, it's asia uh india and um there's some in africa and they all vary slightly they they, they call satinwood uh ceylon and then there's another one the one from africa they all vary a little bit but this one is the true from what i understand the true satinwood but then they all say they're the true side <laughs> <laughs> because they all want to take credit. But this is supposed to be the true side one. And why did you pick that? Is I never heard it made into drums before. Well, it's really hard. It's twenty six hundred on the scale on the Janka scale, and it's also lighter. It's just prettier, really pretty wood. It's like mm. pretty nice to work with. I wanted to. I was looking for a replacement for Yellow Heart because right now you cannot get Yellow Heart anywhere. Mm. Uh, I have no idea why. Um, 
there are some people that have it, but it's not. I can't get it in veneers. I can't get it in solid lumber. And then the last one, which like, is it the hardest one? Ebony is that the hardest? Of yeah, this batch of this batch. Yeah, thirty-two twenty. That's very hard. Yeah, yeah, more than twice as hard as maple. It's closed grain. People need to realize that a lot of these exotics, they also have a lot of oils and tannins, tannins being acids. So you just don't start gluing these up with the regular wood glue and expect them to stick. Mm. You know, you, you have to treat them, you have to do, there's a lot of steps you have to go through. And then, you'll, you know, consequently, you don't start with these thin veneers and just start spreading glue on them either, even after you treat them, you know, because it's just, there's a lot of things that happen think of a piece of paper when you wet it what's going to happen it's going to wrinkle it's going to buckle or a piece of card where it does the same thing so you have to understand and take precautions and take necessary steps to ensure a nice flat uh glue up mm. you know so it's it's a little bit of work in making these uh i use two ply that i buy pre-made from two sources it's really good, great stuff and then i i can now work with the raw veneers which is something i you know Spent a lot of time on this past year. Which of these six was the most pain in the butt to work with? They were all about the same. Really? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they were all about the same. Yeah, it was. It, it's just, it's just time. You just got to be very methodical in your steps. You know, um, you have to be very precise in 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 making sure you don't skip anything. And the timing of you have to flatten all these things first. Sometimes they come to you, they're wrinkly. But I will say that the the exotics are generally pretty flat because they're usually pre-stabilized or pretty hard already. So uh, the satin wood was a little difficult. Um, believe it or not, the silver birch that I've been working with is, is very difficult. Even after I flatten it and when it dries out, it just loves to get wrinkly again because it has a, mm. has a figuring to it. So you have to time it correctly. You have to time it after you flatten it when you have a window to work with it to make sure that you get a good glue up. And this is all this is all just trial and error because every one of them is different. You know, it's like working with a different band or a different bass player. You know, you know each bass player that you work with. Each one has his own thing, and then you know how to lock in with that that person. So it's the same thing. Each species presents a different set of circumstances. So working with ones that are predictable or more straightforward is always desirable. You know, so have you had any like failure rate with these woods, or they've all sure? Been? So what sure. happens? How do you know when it's like not going to work, and then what do you do? Uh, as soon as you take it out of the mold, or you know, you press. What I do is I start with a thin veneer, and you you glue it up into a two ply. You can't just start. You can, but it's not recommended. You start putting these thin veneers in a mold because they're going to buckle as you start spreading glue. Mm -hmm. And what happens under pressure when you when you clamp them up is that they can fracture. Mm. So you know it, it it can create lines that you won't see, uh, and these splits will come out later as the shell cures and when you put finish on them. So what you have to do is you have to pre stabilize it. So I do a two ply to start, like the two ply I buy, but in smaller sections for each size. So I put down a lengthwise piece and I put down the gross grain piece on top of the glue, and we press that. So then I know right away once I pull it out of the press, I know did I get a good glue up or not. Mm. And then I have a window of opportunity while the stuff is still flexible before the glue sets up entirely to get it in the mold and work with it. So what do you, what do, you do when it's a bad one? Does it just go straight to the fire pit? <laughs> well, if it's big enough, I might be able to trim it down and use it for another. Like it's just the edges. Mm. You know what I mean? If it's in the middle, I won't see it right away. But you generally will. Um, so yeah, it's it's a matter of yeah, it just gets scrapped. It's only happened a couple of times early on when I was learned. You know what I there was one more step I needed to add. You know to to make to ensure that didn't happen. Mm. So these these six are all 100 percent of each timber, which which is a, there's a lot of other brands who. Just put an outer veneer over top of it or something and call it a Correct. veneer or something. So Yeah. Um, which kind of obviously contributes to the price. That's why you can find a quote-unquote ebony drum for much less than what you need to charge for one. 
which we talked. That's important that we reiterate. These are 100 percent. That ebony shell is 100 percent ebony. Yeah. It's not a maple shell with a veneer on it. <laughs> it's true. You know, I mean, everybody's got their thing and everybody does what they can. It's, you know, as I said a moment ago, it's not easy to work with these woods. And if the people are making their own shells, there's a lot more time involved. But if, if you get the system down, it moves pretty quickly. You know, and, and so you just do that same thing for each. So when I was talking about gluing up the two ply, if I'm making an eight by 14 shell for snare drum, I have to do that four times, mm -hmm. you know, so now I can glue up several layers in my press at a time. I can glue up those four layers all at once, but because I want them to be workable, I don't want to glue them all up at once. Mm, right, right. So what I'll do is I'll glue up two, two sections at a time put the once they come out of the press, I'll put the first layer in, turn the other one around, and then glue that up. And then the next day do the same thing. So I'll do that four times to get the A ply or three times. You know, so it takes time. But first you gotta prep all this stuff. And that takes mm. takes about a week mm. just to prep it all. Yeah, it's a lot. A lot of time. You also I mean, have to I was gonna say I was just gonna say you also have to make sure the stuff's seamless. Because a lot of the veneers I'll get, like Ebony came to me, was only like three or four inches wide. But mm -hmm. well, what if I'm gluing up a piece that's this wide, right? So uh, you have to be able to join those pieces together and make them seamless so that they look like one piece. And that's not easy. Yeah. You know, it takes time. So I actually developed a tool because whenever I'm doing this, I'm always thinking about how can I train other people to do this because it's really important. I right, when I can say, go, go trim that veneer and they can do it. No, you, you, you don't have to think about it. You just use this tool and it takes them literally seconds to cut mm. this thing perfectly straight because veneer fractures, it splits, it shatters. You can't just use a knife and on a straight edge because that knife wants to fall into the grain every time oh, right. and it wants to chip out. If you use a table saw, same thing. So you have to be very, very uh, cautious, you know, in doing so. And you don't want to see any voids. You know, you don't want anything, you want that to be perfect. And, you know, and I, this tool is, and I don't know why they don't sell this thing, but maybe I'll have to make one and start selling them. <laughs> you know, it, it's amazing. It just, it saves me a huge amount of headache and time. Mm. You know, since I am, I do work by myself quite often. So it's important for me to be able to move from one thing to the next. And also while this stuff is treated and ready to go into the molds, you know, it dries out quickly. And my, my shop, my new shop is very, very dry and warm this time of year. So once I once I treat this stuff, it dries out really fast and becomes unworkable. So I have to be mm. very ambitious in my, my time. I mean, there's something to be said about the visual appeal of just a veneer of some of these, which I, you know, I can understand. Oh, I sure. I like the look of rosewood. Throw Absol it on your favorite maple shell. It's going to look awesome. It's going to sound like absolutely one of my favorite woods is Coco Bolo. If you know what that is, it's mm -hmm. like a deep red, dark cherry, like almost black red with white contrast. You know, it's beautiful. So yeah, it's it's absolutely. I mean, you know, you know as well as I do. When people buy an instruments, the first thing they do is they look at it. Yeah. You know, and they walk in the store and they go, "Ooh, I got to have that." Before they even know what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. You know, and you got a lot of drums coming from overseas like that. Some of them goods, you know, really, really great companies out there making great drums. And some of them not. You know, it depends on your price point, depends on what you want to spend. I'd like to see more manufa manufacturing come back to the United States. You know, there's just not enough of it going on. And, and guys like me, when we're gone, you know, uh, not everybody can work in a cubicle. Not everybody can work at a computer all day. Uh, we need some manufacturing back in, back here. We really do. And that's what I try to do. I try to make everything here. So when people buy my drums, I want them to know that my hands were on it. Mm -hmm. You know, they were on the shells. It, it makes, some people, it makes no difference to them where the shells come from. And some people makes all the difference. I think in me, if I'm going to spend the money, X amount of dollars on a drum kit, I want it. I want it what I want, you know, I want it to be made in quality. I don't want it to come from, you know, a foreign country, is but there, that's me. There is, there is no discernible sound difference when you're talking about veneers on the outside, right? Like what, how much I don't really think so. do you need to have before it actually makes a difference? How many, well, the, ins, the inside chamber makes the most difference. 
Mm. You could, you could take, I made a uh, birch shell with bubingo on the inside and it makes all the difference. Gum. And gum how makes much? It, how much? Just two, two plies. Like if you're doing an eight ply shell, you do two plies inside, it'll make a difference. That interior chamber is, is where it's at and also where the drum head sits, but primarily my, my semi-solid shells. The semi-solid shells, the drum head sat on that solid wood portion, which by the way, with these new, we'll be, we're going to be diving back into that in time, mm. in the semi-solids, but on the, on the bass drums and floor toms primarily. So yeah, it's, it makes a difference. And sometimes in the middle. So like if you're doing a three ply shell, maple, poplar, maple, then that'll make a difference. The outside is really minimal mm. and it depends on the thickness of it. You know, right, all these that veneers. Part, that part of the wood never actually touches the drum head, right? Usually. It can, depending on the bearing edge. If you cut a 45 all the way out to the edge, yeah. It's, it's, it, I'm sure it makes a difference, but it's probably so, you know, you just can't tell. You know, it's like a, you, if you got a eight ply maple drum and seven plies are maple and the outside is ebony, you're just never going to hear that. Mm -hmm. What did you um, realize as you put these things together sonically? Were they more similar or different than you expected? Or Well, you I, I, you've had more time with them than I did. Like, I got them together. I literally got them out to you. Um, I didn't yeah. even really get them I got to send them back to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, no, but it, it was one of those things. Like, I already kind of knew in my mind, just from the tap test of the shells. Like, when I tap test them, I hold them up, I tap, check them. That once they're cured and I glue them up, that tells me did I do a good glue up or not. If I'm getting um, a weird tone or I'm not getting resonance, then then I didn't get a good glue up. It doesn't really happen, but you know it's my way of testing it. But almost every shell resonated at the same pitch, mm. which was really interesting to me uh, because they all varied so greatly in hardness. And I think what what happens is when you get up a certain hardness range it's really discernible it's hard to discern excuse me um what the differences are mm -hmm. you know and, and tonal you know, like you can you did a really good job capturing each drum but if you put a little bit of tape on or a moon gel and and put it in, you're not really going to hear that much of a difference mm -hmm. so it's it's out of our normal listening range first of all what we're used to we're used to maple birch mahogany you know cherry so they're, they're more down than what i would say the normal tuning range but when you get up into this higher register it's all together different mm -hmm. but the feel is what's what i like about these is the feels i feel it's great they get a really good feel like the rosewood the feel is incredible you get a nice response up top uh, and, and I think that's one thing that the really hardwoods do is they offer more rebound, a better feel and better response. You can get a much lower sound out of what I would call a normal tuning than you would out of like a maple. They, mm. they do give a low pitch at, at normal. So, yeah. And then they also I... give that bite, you know, like you tune them high, you have the really nice high tunings. The ones tunings that really, and all the drums that really like appealed to me were like the second and third tunings. Yeah. They just really sounded great. You could do anything with them. Yeah, I've taken each one of these to a gig, so they've all been played for at least three hours in a live situation. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and the feel was strikingly different with all of them. Um, they, like, I just used the, um, the mahogany the other night it responded well to muffling better than the other ones. Like it wanted to be kind of a little bit more of a fluffier sound, but I still kept it tuned kind of high. Like you said, it had more low end. So the muffling brought out the low end. Whereas the rosewood and the ebony, I could have had those things wide open and no one would have complained about it like being too bright or too ringy. Yeah, they're drier. The harder woods are drier. Mm -hmm. Some, you know, uh, it's funny. Some of them aren't. But for the most part, the, I found them, the ones that we like, like the rosewood and the ebony, they're drier. Yeah. And they're, they're extremely hard. And the satin wood rings a bit, uh, but in a, it's pleasing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like natural reverb. Uh, and it, But it's not uncontrollable. You could put a little gaff tape on there, and it would probably be ideal. Yeah. So I'm not against muffling drums. It's just that I always... I remember reading Modern Drummer back when I was a kid, you know, and I remember reading an article about when you, if you want to be heard, do not muffle your drums, you know, and let them sing out, let them ring out. And so 
when I had my, I just posted a picture of my town as I had, and I got this really beautiful artwood snare, maple snare with the drum with three rings. And, and I couldn't tune that bugger. You could tune it from the top, the bottom head from the top. It had that special key. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it just wasn't giving me the, a rock sound. So I trained it in on a Black Beauty, you mm-hmm. know, because that was the drum at the time. And, I, you know, this is, I was, what, 21 years old. So was, we're going way back. Uh, and, and I left that thing wide open. You know, and I just pummeled that thing every weekend. It's great. You know? <laughs> I mean, it, it, mentioning the Black Beauty, I felt like some of these were the closest to a metal, to a brass sound of any wood drum I've ever played. Versus some some wood drums sound like they can just sound really bright and bringy, like like steel. But yeah, these had like that, like like comp- complexity of. The brass, like that, that projection yeah. and complexity, they were like the, the 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 bridge between a wood drum and a brass drum, in my opinion. Yeah, you know, you've got a lot of these are very closed grain, you know, and they, or intertwined grain, ropey grain, they call it, and so um, it, it, it yields, and because of the hardness, it yields that kind of sound. So, uh, but you know, a lot of times guys will go to aluminum drums for that reason. You know, you've got the chunky sound that little bit of woody tone but a metallic sound and i feel like these are in that vein mm. but maybe a little more pleasing you know a good volume too you know you're not gonna be lacking on volume with these i think i don't know about you but the most surprising drum in the whole bunch was the mahogany mm. for I think me the most different for sure but it just it it performed well you know it better it held its own against all these crazy exotic drums yeah you know I really like the satinwood personally in the second and third tuning you did. I thought that was fantastic. Yeah, the satinwood and the mahogany seemed to to really come to life a little bit lower. Yeah. The bubinga, I think, sounded great everywhere. Jatoba sounded really nice, a little bit higher. And then the rosewood and the ebony, it's like you couldn't tune them too high. They just still sounded full and, and yeah. open. Yeah. The Jatoba makes a, a tremendous kit. I made a few kits with it. It's just really beefy, a little bit more beefy than Bubinga even. Mm. Uh, so it's six ply with three rings in the kit. It's just they just shout. They just shout sound. Uh, I did a twenty four inch bass drum, and it just it was it sounded like a twenty eight. It was just huge, mm. tremendous sound. Um, if you like big sound, but not uncontrollable. You know, it's really like like mahogany or excuse me, like Bubinga is thick. You know, it's got that thick sound to it. Jatoba is very similar, but even a little bit more. And I started working with it because, like you said, just in case Bubinga becomes unavailable, yeah. I wanted to make sure that I could use something similar. And Jatoba is right now more expensive than Bubinga, but is mm-hmm. readily available. Now, are anyway. all of these available enough to make a whole kit if you wanted to? Of any? Oh, yeah, things? absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's my plan. You know, I'm going to handpick. I mean, I could do anything. You know, somebody calls me up, says, I want a Purple Heart kit or, you know, I want a Rosewood kit with, uh, you know, a different core, a Bubinga core. I could do that. Not a problem. Which of these do you think would combine well with other species? All of them? Any of them? None of them? I really wouldn't. Mm. You know, Mahogany is probably the only one I would combine with. uh, Now, unless we do snare drums, if you do... Primarily a Jatoba or a Bubinga core, and then a decorative outside, rosewood outside, or an ebony outside. That would be a lesser expensive option than going with 100% ebony in a kit. Mm. So, if you wanted a whole kit out of ebony, you can do that. You may not want to pay for it, <laughs> but you know, it's not. Well, I mean, it's just like anything, you know. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, I don't. I'm not sure that I would want an ebony bass drum, though. You know, like that. I think that'd be seem- cool. Be- I'm going to be doing it. I'm going to be doing it. <laughs> I have to now. See, you know, you just, these are things. I, the reason I started doing this is I'm very happy with the way I'm making shells. I'm buying my two plier and making shells, but it's getting really expensive. Sometimes it's problematic. Sometimes I'm waiting a while to get it. But there's a different glue in there. Mm. You know, I'm getting these four by eight sheets that are, you know, they're very unmanageable too. The glue cures and I come to me rolled up and I have to flatten the stuff and it becomes difficult to work with and it affects my ability to cut the seams. So I have to do some extra work there, but it's also a different glue. So it's important for me to know if I can 
and I'm seeing a difference. I'm hearing a difference in the kit I just made for you and, uh, and, and the most recent silver birch and some snares I've made and all those snares, except for two, which I mentioned, all those snares are have hundred percent of the same glue. And so I'm noticing a big difference mm -hmm. in the, in the purity, the sound, the feel and the overall tone and the, and the resonance. And uh, it's one factor that people need to consider. You know, I use a very, very hard glue. It's 6,000 PSI, and it has minimal shrinking. Um, and it's, it's a lot of chemicals in it, so I'm killing more brain cells every day. But, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, the, the minimal shrinking aspect is really important. Now, we talked about this you know, off, off camera a while back. The three that, were, that I thought had the most vibrant sound were the rosewood, ebony, and satinwood. And that's when you mentioned the glue. Like, did that contribute to that extra kind of, like, high fidelity? And that's kind of hard it's to possible. describe. There's, like, this this crispiness in the high end. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the other two, um, they they have a combination. They were two ply I bought. The Bubinga and the and the Jatova were two pie I bought that was pre made. Now it's a great glue, don't get me wrong. It's they use it in for this purpose. However, it's a different glue. Hmm. So it's a softer glue and uh glued up in a different way. So I feel like, yeah, definitely. So you got the combination of the exotic, the species itself, and then you got the combination of the glue. Uh, and a better longevity. Plus, these exotics require that you use a more chemical-based glue that will adhere and stick to that type of wood. Hmm. All right, talk me out of this this stupid idea. So, <laughs> you know, it's a custom shop. I do whatever the hell I want. So I'm going to have an ebony veneer on everything. So it's going to be a quote-unquote ebony kit. But... Given what I've experienced with these species, I would do a mahogany bass drum, mahogany floor tom, bubinga rack toms, and then a rosewood snare. Yeah, you could do that. Not would a that problem. be weird? Would that be a weird mix? No, not at all. No, I think it'd be cool uh, because, as you know, I mean, certain species lend themselves to certain size drums. Mm. Uh, that's that's something that I'm not against at all. Uh, when I was doing semi solids, I used to mix up purple heart and yellow heart. We do yellow heart bass drum, and snare drum, and then purple heart toms. Mm. It was cool. Yeah, it's not a, you know, mahogany bass drums just kill. I mean, you know that. We all know that. Yeah. Four toms too. And so, be being a rack toms, also, they sing, they just got that tone. They're going to be a little different. They're not going to sound identical, but by the time you get down to floor tom bass drum, really kind of negligible. It just like, doesn't matter. So it just really comes out to head choice and tuning. Yeah. You know, now, would it just be just the same if I said do all Babinga with Ebony? You could do that. I mean, would it, that be sonically so similar that why bother mixing them you up? You can have a little bit more uh, attack and a little bit more, you know, a little bit brighter. Hmm. But I mean, I just made these Ebony kits and they just kill. You know, it's they just really, really kill. They're just amazing to me. The, the floor toms, they, they sing, they're beefy, the bass drums are huge. It's, it's not against the rules. It, it's, the shell thickness has a lot to do with it. Mm. You know, the, 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 the huge, the thicker you go with these really hardwoods, the uh, possibility of choking out is greater. Oh, okay. So, like, because what you do is you're creating a brick. Mm. You know, you, you get to a point where you're, you know, you go over eight plies and you start getting a shell that's so high pitched and, and tonality that it's kind of a brick so in snare drums that might be fine but you're not going to do that on floor tom bass drum or rack tom mm -hmm. so the combination i've been really loving for the b bang is six ply with the re-ring eight ply re-ring just it works it sounds great gives me a little more surface area a lot of round over it's more of a taper what i do i keep saying it's a round over but i realize that i'm it's really just a taper i taper it over it rounds over tapers up to the Two thirds, three quarters over, and then a little bit of a cut back, whether it's got re rings or not, and then the contact points more towards the inside part of the shell. Is that different uh, than what you would do with a domestic shell? No, pretty similar. Okay. I do I do both both ways. I've been gradually kind of pushing the envelope of the contact point over a little bit more, get a little more shell contact point, and um, 
not all the way though. And it's just, it's, I find it's easier to tune. And uh, not that anything, my drums are difficult to tune, but it's, if I can increase or speed up the tunability, then why not? Mm -hmm. You know, um, but I started doing all this. It's kind of like, you know, I didn't have to do this. I could just sat still and, but this is part of what I do. And this is something else for me to offer, you know? Sweet. I there's a lot, there's a lot of builders out there. You know, people need to understand ply shells are always going to be king. Oh, yeah. And I will, I will, I just put that on my headstone, you know, <laughs> I mean, because, you know, in 50 years from now, my drums will still be around. All right. You know, and, and I'm not being, uh, I'm not being negative when I say this, but solid wood drums probably will not, or they won't be in the same condition. Mm. It's unlikely. That's because more prone to cracking and, and shrinkage or whatever. Yeah. They're more prone to the elements. Mm. I don't care how well, how good of a job you do in making these things, they're just not going to last. I mean, when I build cabinets, you know, I spent a lot of years building cabinets and, and I would do a lot of raised panel doors, but I wasn't going to do a raised panel door solid wood over 10 inches or so. Because what happens is that that wood, I don't care where I get the wood from, it's going to shrink and pop out of the door frame. Mm. You know, you just can't be helped. It's, it could be kiln dried lumber, the premium stuff. I've always bought the best stuff. It's going to shrink and pop out of the frame. So anything over that, I would take a plywood substrate and laminate a solid thin piece to the top, wrap it in solid wood, and then raise it and put it inside the frame. And now you've got a, a plywood core with solid wood all the way around it. And now it's stabilized. It can't move. It can't go anywhere. It acts and treats and stains just like solid wood. But now I've just done the, the customer service. It took me a lot more time to do that. Mm-hmm. Okay, instead of just gluing some boards up, raise them and put them in a frame. But now I just made a, a piece of furniture that'll last forever. Mm -hmm. You know, so everything I, I put that same attention to detail and the same quality into all the drums I build. If, if there's something not right with my drums, I, I can't recall anything that's ever not been right. It's either an oversight where my old man eyes just didn't see it, you know? <laughs> and, and so it's just, you know, I'm very, I scrutinize the, the Jesus out of everything. Yeah. That's why I think every drummer needs to find their local custom builder. And that's, that's the, the key, right? Well, find someone who can I, I'm not do God. it right. <laughs> well, I mean, I got drums worldwide, man. You know, I mean, people need to understand I have drummers that have been playing my drums since 2006, mm -hmm. you know, Paul Bonnie from uh, Australian Pink Floyd. They do, they used to do close to 300 shows a tour, a, a year on tour. And how many kits has he gone through over the years? He's Not still, many, he's, just because, uh, you know what happens to them? They melt under the lights. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, they have a big lighting system behind them. And the two floor toms, the 16 and the 18, they melt. <laughs> they melt the wrap. But, you know, when I'm making new stuff, I want him to have that. You know, I want him to, you know, and... Uh, be up with what I'm doing, you know, mm -hmm. and so, and I try to do that with all the artists, you know, this is what I'm doing now. And I think, you know, this is a great opportunity for you guys to share it with everybody. So this is, this is what we got going on. As I make what I call improvements, you know, everything's the same, but it's like your rooms, you know, your, your room there mm -hmm. and your studio, they work for you. You were working in them, mm -hmm. but then you do that final step and you treat them and it's like, okay, now you're done. Yeah, yeah. Just, you know, you, you're, you're at a point where you can function, you feel really, really good about it. You might make small changes or improvements, you know, with cords or mics or cameras or whatever. They're little things, but, and that's kind of where I am with my drums. It's like I've, I've got to the point where, like, everything is possible. I can do everything and anything, but I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to scale it down. You know, you, there will be options. If you yeah. want, if you want everything, then you're going to pay for everything. <laughs> so, you, you know, I, you had suggested I send back the Ope Toms to, to rework the edges. So what are you doing differently from when I got that kit five years ago, three years ago, four years 20, ago? 2020, four years ago now, almost four years. Yeah. So, um, I just have a new flatting station. So in other words, I had a piece of granite I was using to grind that stuff down on. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I have a piece of marble that's even flatter. Mm, okay. okay. And then I also have a gauge called a, a surface plate. 
So after I grind it, I take the drum. I didn't have this before. They're actually really, really expensive. If you look up granite surface plate, just look it up. And then to get one adequate size. So I got a, a, a surface plate. And what I do is I put each shell, okay, on, on the surface plate. And I put a light inside and I just turn it. And then if I see any light coming through, I know I got to keep going. Mm. And so I do this for every drum. I do this for bass drums up to 20 inch. Um, and so uh, I, what I do is I cut the outside of the, of the shell, I cut the inside, then I grind it down and I do this to each side of each drum. Then I check it on the surface plate. If it needs more grinding, I grind it. And then I go and I cut the outside and the inside again. So I go through a lot of steps and a lot of time just to get the bearing edges right. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of variables in a drum. You know, you got the edge, the contact point, then you've got the drum head, then you got the hoop, you know, and then you got the shell itself. And, and some, sometimes drum heads are wonky. Each mm -hmm. manufacturer of drum heads is different. You know, the Remo collar comes up, you know, it's like this and the Evans is more curved. So the contact point changes. So all these things are really, really important. So if I know the shells, as close to perfect as I can get it, and then that takes the other variables and, you know, it narrows it down, makes it easier to tune and get a better sound. So I just wanted to check it because your kit, that kit was built under the old tools. And so I just thought, well, let's just, because the thin pie shells, again, I want to round that over a little bit more. I want to mm -hmm. see if it makes a difference. And and it, and it also improves the feel a little bit. So, you know, you, you might have a bigger gig where you want that kit. You might want the new kit, you know, have options. Uh, I want to see, you know, just double check it on the surface plates, see where it's at. Sweet. All right. We'll have to report back once I get them over to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's fun for me because it, it's also a way I test myself. It's like, well, how good of a job did I do back then? Was I mm. doing the right? Was I spending enough time on that? You know, I'm my own worst enemy. I really that, was, I, that was at the, the start of the pandemic, too. So yeah. who knows psychologically where any of us were? <laughs> well, that yeah, time. that's true, too. I mean, I, you know, for the most part, I do check these things and I do, and everything's fine. But that was really the beginning when I started making oak kits. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't made too many oak kits. So it's, uh, in fact, yours was like the first or second oak complete kit. So I really wanted to oak be in a different species. I wanted to, I'd like to check it. It's a really porous wood and, um, you know, I've changed, made a couple changes with the glue since then. So it's just, uh, just a matter of, you know, me just following up and being the guy who I am, you know, just, if somebody brings drum in, I want to check it, you know? Mm -hmm. Sweet. Yeah. I mean, it's had well over 300 gigs at this point, well over it. Wow. So, <laughs> who knows? It's in good shape. I just changed the heads for the first time in a year, and it's still sounding good. The New Year's Eve gig, it still sounded good. So. Well, that, well, I hope so. I mean, that's the whole idea. Yeah, I mean, I feel really good about it, but it's just it's just my barometer. You know, just like, you know, as I, as I get more and more into this and, and, and do it every day. I like to just double check because in the meantime, I've moved the shop. I've yeah. changed tools. I've been like, was the old way I was doing it? Was that good enough? You know, mm -hmm. I don't want to create more work for myself. Yeah, so, right. You know what I mean? So it's like, do, am I creating more work for myself or am I, uh, you know, or is this really necessary? Sweet. So it's just a way of checking all that. All right. Well, thank you so much. We're going to end it there because I want to get to demoing these snares. So cool. Okay. The first drum you're going to hear, this is the African mahogany. Again, this is somewhere around 1200 on the Janko hardness scale, depending on the source. Um, this was for me, the, the deepest sounding, darkest sounding of the bunch. It preferred lower tunings compared to the others, but a pretty amazing drum. All of these drums I took on gigs and recorded in the studio and they were all quite amazing. So let's check out the African mahogany.
Okay, let's step up to a slightly harder species. This one is Babinga. This is African species. This is 1980 on the hardness scale. This one to me, you'll hear, again, all these drums are being played, I think four different tunings, high, medium, high, medium, and then medium, low. I didn't go super low with any of them because it kind of loses the character at that point. But Babinga felt really kind of punchy and had a nice, like, strong impact to it. A lot of fun to play. So here's Babinga. Now let's check out the Jatoba. Jatoba is around 2350 on the hardness scale, so it's a bit harder than Babinga. has a similar characteristic. I felt this was a really kind of, um, this had a lot of impact. This, this drum was a lot of fun. This one was like, surprised me the most out of the bunch. So here's Jatoba. All right, now let's dig into the Bolivian Rosewood. This one is somewhere between 2200 and 2400 on the hardness scale. It's from South America. It's from Bolivia, obviously. This was my second favorite of the bunch. This thing has so much life, so much. Um, it's sensitive, but it's it's not too ringy. This was this was a great drum that kind of blends some metallic snare, you know, brass and maple, kind of somewhere in the middle. So here's the Bolivian Rosewood.
Now let's check out satin wood. This was a species I'd never heard of, and I've definitely never heard drums made of it before. This is around 2620 on the hardness scale. It comes from either Southeast Asia or different parts of Africa. Um, this one had similar kind of like vibrance as the rosewood, but just liked a slightly lower tuning. So this one sounds a little bit fatter than the rosewood, maybe leaning more towards a wood drum than a metal drum, but still had all that extra crispiness that I'm really loving from these exotic drums. So here is the satin wood. All right, our last drum is the Makassar Ebony. This one is really hard. It's like 3220 on the Janka scale. This was by far my favorite of all six of these drums, and it was many, many people's favorites. I know Chris has made a few of these since we did the initial demos, and this actual drum got sold before I had a chance to do the second demos, which is why you will hear I'm playing a different groove for these, these tuning demos because I'd done this batch of demos before the rest and the drum sold so I couldn't go back and redo it but this drum was amazing took it on the gig it sounded like it was mic'd up when it wasn't mic'd up but it wasn't a, it wasn't too aggressive or harsh it just sounded like it was throwing a really balanced sound throughout the room everyone loved it everyone that heard it commented on it quite frankly the guitarist even said it was an amazing sounding drum how often does your guitarist comment on your snare drum so here is the Makassar Ebony um, again, all these drums have similar characteristics, but there's some subtlety. So go back and forth, listen to them, compare them. Um, all of these drums are available, so you can contact Chris over at the Bucks County Drum Company website. If you want one, um, he'll have to build you an ebony, but I believe the other five might still be available, the ones I actually played. So here is the Makassar Ebony. I have one listener question to answer here. This one, I probably answered this one before, but it's a topic I get asked a lot, so why not do it again? I need some questions, so shoot them over to drumcandypodcast at gmail.com. It can be about anything, gear stuff, playing stuff, career stuff, whatever it may be, shoot them over, drumkennypodcast at gmail.com. So this question 
came in from Mike. Any advice on what to do when the room doesn't like your snare? That is an awesome question because it happens to me. I want to say 50% of the time, the snare drum that I think is going to work in a room ends up not being the one that works in the room. So I always take two options. Um, basically, I similar drums, one metal, one wood. So if I'm going to be playing in a situation where the dynamics might be a little bit lower and require a little bit more control, I'll use a shallower drum, usually a 5x14 brass and then a 5.5x14 wood. Lately, it's been either a Ludwig Chrome Over Brass uh, Superphonic or the Bucks County Satin Brass for my metal drum. And then for the wood drum, I've been using a 5.5 by 14 uh, Oak Prime Series, or I just recently got a European um, Silver Birch that I'm, I'm trying out. So for those type of gigs where I need to play a range of dynamics, but mostly on the controlled side, I'll use shallower drums, one brass, one some sort of versatile wood drum. Brass to me has the most like balanced overtones, so it, it tends to sit in different room acoustics better. Um, but sometimes it's just too much drum, and that's when I go to the wood option. If it's a louder situation, or if I need like deeper, thuddier sounding snare, I'll usually take a six and a half by fourteen brass and a six and a half by fourteen wood. Um, again, whatever your favorite drum is. Just the other week, I played an old um, pork, pork pie black on brass, which is a Black Beauty um, copy. Sounded incredible. Sometimes I use an 8x14 maple that's you know deadened up a bunch. So again, I use the same basic dimensions for a louder gig, deeper, 6.5. Sometimes I go to an 8. One brass, one of whatever your favorite wood is. Brass just seems to always work. Aluminum sometimes can be a little like thin or too dry for certain rooms. So I tend to not go that way too often anymore. Brass seems to always work. For the wood drums, I think any good quality maple, birch, cherry, really anything is going to work. Just don't go too esoteric with like your, your vintage, you know, 1950s <laughs> roundover or something. That'll probably be a little bit too dull for most rooms. So hope that helps. Always take two drums with you um, and just expect that one of them's not going to work that night. Again, shoot me your questions, drunkkennypodcast at gmail.com. We don't have a lesson this week because I wanted to run the full interview with Chris for about the exotic snares. I feel like that's a, a lesson in itself right there. But we do have a warehouse pick of the week. This is, again, we have a whole slew of DFD practice pads, two-sided practice pads. One side has a thick closed cell um, foam that's soft, feels like a floor tom, it's very quiet. And the other side is a kind of harder, classic black rubber that feels more like a snare drum. Uh, we took these to PASIC, sold out by the end of the show. They were very popular, so we still have a whole bunch of them. So here's the, the promo video I made for that before. Um, go check them out. It's on Drum Factory Direct. Just look up DFD Practice Pad. Pro Pad, I believe, is what we're calling it. Eight inches. So here you go. This is the 8-inch Drum Factory Direct double-sided portable practice pad. We spent about a year developing this thing to make sure it had the best possible options. We wanted to have a nice soft feel on one side and a more traditional rubber feel on the other side. We made this double thick on the softer side. This is closed cell foam, double thickness. This gives you a quieter sound and a softer rebound for a little bit more of a workout. It feels a little bit more like a detuned snare drum or a floor tom. And on the other side, we have a medium hardness rubber surface that has more rebound, more attack, a little bit more like snare drum practice for this side. So super versatile. It's on a sturdy nine inch wooden base with beveled edges. Easily can throw into your backpack or your laptop bag or your suitcase for traveling. Warming up before shows, you can throw it in your cymbal bag. Super proud about this. So you're not gonna get a better quality pad for this price. So check it out, the DFD eight inch portable practice pad. And that is it for this week's episode. Please like, share, subscribe, give us a review. Um, we are, we're seeing fewer reviews posted, so if you haven't reviewed the show and you've been listening and you dig it, please just write a review on iTunes or Spotify or Google Podcasts, wherever you get the show. It does help it rank higher. 
Um, I want the show to keep growing. It's been a little bit plateaued, so let's give it a bump this week. That's my one request. Give us a five-star rating. Share it if you dig it. Uh, write a review. I guess that's three requests. Anyway, see you next week. Have a good one.